Before we start this episode of the podcast, I just want to let you know about two events we have coming up this fall that you may be interested in. First up, September 22nd through 25th is our brewery and distillery workshop designed for breweries and distilleries and planning. It's a four-day intensive with professionals who will help you launch your new craft beverage business on the right foot. Learn more about that at breweryworkshop.com. Then in October, we're bringing my favorite event of the year, the Brewers a Treat to the East Coast, along with our friends at Dogfish Head in Delaware. If you have ever wanted to homebrew with brewing heroes like Sam Calagione, and Vinny Chalurzo, this is your chance, and we're thrilled to have so many great brewers involved, like Avery of Keeping Together, Henry from Monkish, Chris from Green Bench, Neil from Weldworks, Steve from Fidens, and more. Tickets went on sale for all access subscribers last week, and there are about a dozen spots left as I record this. So get your tickets now at brewersretreat.com, and don't miss out. the craft beer brewing podcast i'm jamie bogner and today i'm in austin texas consider uh, continuing my uh, traipsing around the country uh, a lot of travel this year a lot of travel this year but we have a brewery accelerator event here in austin uh, and that is an occasion for me to head over to meanwhile brewing joining me from meanwhile is director of brewing operations robert fullweiler welcome to the podcast robert thanks for having me on jamie this is my second time at Meanwhile. We came down here shortly after Meanwhile opened after filming video classes for our all access program with Joe Morfeld and a few and Jeff Stuffings and a few others back in 2021. Um, and I, I, we picked Austin as that destination then because I could drive there from Colorado and not get on a plane because it was still, uh, you know, pandemic time and everything else. So um, that was a very careful, cautious trip. Having an outdoor beer garden at Meanwhile where we could sit outside and uh, drink beer it was actually, I mean, it was a nice thing to be yeah. able to do. We, I remember we wrapped up that class with Joe and then Joe, Joe Morfeld, Joe Stang and I all came over here and had a couple of beers and, uh, mm -hmm. um, and it was fun to see it then, but my goodness, <laughs> what a crazy brewery facility, beer garden, everything that it really is. It's an ambitious project. It's, you know, the beer garden is enormous. Um, we stopped by on a Saturday afternoon yesterday and had some tacos and grabbed a beer just to check it out with our event staff. And it was packed on a Saturday afternoon, families with kids, tables, every like playground. Like, I mean, there's just this, there's five food trucks. It takes five food trucks <laughs> to serve this entire beer garden. The idea of that is insane when most breweries are, you know, struggle to keep one coming consistently. Um, but that's the scale that Meanwhile is at. And of course, over the last number of years, as Meanwhile has, uh, has cranked things up, uh, the, the volume has been growing and growing and growing. And they do, a, you do a lot of beer here out of the tap room and you do a lot of beer on draft around and a little bit of cans out there. But at the same time, meanwhile has also um, been racking up some medals. Uh, 2021 won a gold for meanwhile Pilsner and beer we're drinking right now. 2022 GABF, a silver medal for secret beach, San Diego style IPA, mm -hmm. not West coast, San Diego <laughs> style IPA. And I love that your tap board draws the uh, distinction on those things. World beer cup, uh, silver in 2023 last year for an Arnold Palmer style Kolsch. Um, but then a 2022 gold for meanwhile, Hellas at world beer cup. Mm -hmm. Those are not small things. Those are not nothing, um, especially in the, the scope of that worldwide competition there. And so uh, anyway, uh, Austin, Texas, Central Texas in general has such a strong, uh, strong logger game. You've got to you got to bring your A game to uh, to stand out in this market uh, with folks like Live Oak and ABGB and Altstadt and Lazarus and a whole bunch of others that are making really killer loggers. And uh, you guys are going toe to toe and uh, brewing great iterations of uh, both loggers and IPAs and a whole bunch more. Anyway, we're going to talk about all of that. We're going to talk about, um, you know, the, uh, you know, the, the process and the ingredient choices and, uh, you know, those pieces behind some of these beers. And we're also going to talk about, uh, because you have that particular process uh, optimization background, we're going to talk about uh, some of the, the projects that are underway trying to, um, to generally improve the overall operations of the brew house because you've got a long history of background in that. Anyway, we're going to talk about all of that. But at first, at G&D Chillers, they'll Always strive to build great chillers partner with them as you build great beer but don't just take it from me hey this is josh erickson of jafuncta brewing in mandeville louisiana the team at gd were a critical part of our 10x expansion always just a phone call or email away and thanks to their superior equipment technology and documentation commissioning our new chiller was smooth and straightforward now we can't wait until we need to upgrade our existing chiller 
That's right. Choose G&D Chillers on your next expansion or brewery startup and receive one free year of remote control and monitoring of your new G&D Chiller. There's two of them, two G&D Chillers out back here oh, yeah. at Ned Meanwhile. So uh, anyway, maybe we'll get you to record your, your segment here later on, Robert. <laughs> and Pro Brew is the industry partner the brewers trust to take their operations to the next level, especially when it comes to canning their product for distribution by partnering with Pro Brew. Brewers can fill and seam their canned product to ranges from 100 to 600 cans per minute. Their unique filling process also ensures low dissolved oxygen pickup and focuses on product quality during the entire process. For more information, visit probrew.com or email them at contact us at probrew.com. Probrew, brew your beer. Also, are you struggling to source affordable citrus ingredients due to market fluctuations? Try Old Orchard's flavored craft juice concentrate blends which mimics straight concentrates at a better price point and with a more reliable supply. Old Orchard's citrus-flavored blends include blood orange, grapefruit, lemonade, lime, and tangerine. To learn more and request your free samples, head on over to oldorchard.com slash brewer. All right, Robert, we normally uh, kick it off with a little bit of background. Uh, you've got a long one. You uh, you, you uh, came from the Pacific Northwest, spent a lot of time with a certain brewery up there. Tell, tell us uh, your, your brewing story. Yeah, so um, I was in college at the University of Washington in Seattle, and uh, my first job in the industry, I was just 21. I worked at uh, Bottle Works, uh, the, it's the original beer beer store in Seattle. So classic spot there. Yeah, yeah. great yeah. spot. Still, still there. Uh, you know, when I st- started there, they had something like 1,100 different beers on the shelves, and that was super awesome as a uh, 21 year old, I basically would get paid by bottle works and then spend my whole paycheck just, um, you know, buying like 10 new beers a week. Um, but that was super fun at the time. Um, the person who I replaced at bottle works, uh, ended up leaving to take a brewing job at Fremont brewing, which was just, uh, you know, maybe a mile down the street. And, um, at some point they needed, some, you know, I was, uh, while I was working at bottle works, I was kind of really trying to get in the industry and, um, they, I was asking James who I, I took his job at Bottle Works if, uh, you know, if they ever needed help. And, uh, I ended up being the first ever kind of mobile bottler assistant type person at Fremont. So at that point they were maybe, you know, a thousand barrels, less than a thousand barrels, uh, just draft. Um, and, uh, so I came by and helped them out on their first, first, uh, bottling run, just kind of taking bottles off the machine and packing them into boxes and, um, and that's how I got started there. So I think I was probably employee number five or six or something like that. Um, wow. Uh, pretty early days there. It was a, just a two vessel, 15 barrel, super manual system. Um, and uh, anyways, ended up working through, you know, keg washing, worked in the cellar, got trained as a brewer. You know, I worked as a shift brewer for a few years and then eventually started uh, the laboratory at Fremont. I had, uh, while I was in school, uh, for chemistry. I was kind of still wrapping up the, my degree. Um, uh, I finished that up and they were like, Hey, you know, you know, chemistry, do you want to start a lab? And <laughs> yeah. I was like, initially was a little put off. Like I, I thought of myself as a brewer, not a, a lab person. And, but, uh, kind of took the weekend to think about it and then came back and realized like, Oh, that sounds pretty awesome. Actually, there's a lot of, you know, good, I think I could do at the brewery working on quality improvements and learning a lot about laboratory methods and things like that. So, um, yeah, I spent the next, uh, probably eight years as Fremont grew from that, like 2000 barrels up to, uh, close to 50, maybe past 50,000 barrels, uh, building out laboratory program, sensory, sensory program, uh, things like that. We ended up hiring, having four full-time folks in the lab that I was managing. Um, and then some, somewhere along, along the lines there, uh, Fremont let me sort of start tinkering with some of the automation, uh, automated equipment. Um, so I was able to, uh, you know, st- they, they let me build a cellar temperature control panel, relatively simple thing, you know, where you, we want our, our, uh, tanks to be at 70 degrees. So you built a little, um, uh, out of a PLC, like a little bit, bit of automation that controlled the temperature, uh, of the tanks. And I just kind of was able to build, build stuff up from there. They essentially, they just let me do all kinds of stuff. I wasn't really qualified to do. Um, but, uh, chemistry degree, uh, electrical engineering. Yeah, basically. Sure. Yeah. Sure. They ended up letting me build a, uh, um, you know, a fully automated packaging CIP s- system and a, uh, flash pasteurizer and, 
uh, to this day. I think you've got some weird hobbies, st- Robert. Yeah. Right? <laughs> uh, so, anyways, I got you know. I guess I just in summary, I, I love. Uh, I got really into just brewing, brewing process. I'm really into the sort of technical side of the industry, the process uh, improvement, um, anything you know, beer related, but also. Um, love getting into the uh you know just the the maintenance and the nitty-gritty and everything that just happens to keep the brewery running so um yeah i was at fremont for 13 years um and just i uh, saw this job open here in austin uh, i kind of knew will uh Jayquist, who's the owner brewmaster just through master brewers association and uh i knew now as well who's uh, my predecessor here and applied for the job and kind of didn't didn't really know much about Meanwhile at all. I was like, well, they're only, you know, a couple years old. They can't, I don't know what I thought, but I thought, you know, they'd be a relatively small operation um, and ended up flying down here and was just totally blown away. You know, the beer was fantastic. And like you mentioned, Jamie, the taproom experience is just wild. You know, it's huge. Um, it wonderful. was ambitious. Yeah. <laughs> it was an ambitious launch, especially when it did launch, which was mm-hmm. late 2020, you know, that kind of, like, I mean, yeah. To launch this scale of a business um, at that kind of point, I mean, that had to be just like yeah. terrifying. Absolutely. And I can't, you know, I just started here. I mean, while this past September, so we're still, you know, in the midst of uh, a pretty solid amount of growth. But yeah, we'll open the brewery basically in the middle of the pandemic. So a uh, huge investment uh, to get just get it open and then opened it like uh, when you couldn't really even have anybody inside or people weren't, weren't really traveling or anything like that. So, um, but yeah, it worked out. We're, uh, this past year we did about, uh, 6,200 barrels and we're on pace to do something like 9,000, uh, this coming year. Um, you know, we're selling about 2000 barrels across the bar at the tap room. So super busy tap room. Um, yeah, it's been <laughs> Unbelievable. And it's super, fun, really, really fun place to be really, really solid, solid brewing team and sales team and tap room team. Everyone, you know, it's like, a uh, great to be kind of back at the the point where we're sort of like have all this startup energy and grow you know growth and everyone's everyone's really excited so yeah it's a it's a beautiful place and obviously award winning beer and uh, we've we're, we're kicking off our brewery accelerator with a, a welcome reception right mm-hmm. here this afternoon it's going to be fun to bring everyone here and anyone who hasn't seen it help sh- show them. Uh, what you all are doing because, uh, you know, it's a hub. It's a Sunday morning. Um, you open up at 8 o'clock on a Sunday morning. There's a full-on you know, coffee program, coffee bar. Mm-hmm. There's a flea market out in the, you know, in the uh, the beer garden. And, uh, I mean, people are also ordering beers early in the morning here mm-hmm. and, uh, <laughs> you know, getting their, their brunch on here, ordering some breakfast tacos from the taco truck. I mm-hmm. mean, it's just, you know, it's, it's this... A uh, beautiful buzzing hub of activity, even in a morning in a way that a lot of breweries aren't. It's, it's, it's fascinating to see it. And, uh, it's an interesting example, I think, to share out there with the brewing world to see, um, what it can look like when you go in with big audacious goals like this. I um, should also mention that Will came out of break side and was a break yeah. side before, uh, they, before launching this. And so, um, he was, came out of the Ben Edmonds school of brewery oh, yeah. operation. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, uh, obviously Ben's, uh, helped uh, train up a whole bunch of great brewers uh, and breweries that are now leading their own breweries all over the place. And, uh, um, you know, and so there's uh, you coming from Fremont, uh, them from Bra- Will from Breakside, like a solid Pacific Northwest brewery vibe uh, yeah, uh, here too. Anyway, we'll, uh, I want to talk about uh, some of the beers, especially some of the award-winning beers. We can start with lagers and then we'll talk about uh, IPAs. Before we do that, Streamline efficiency with Omega Yeast's diastole knockout series. The DKO series is comprised of eight familiar yeast strains engineered to knock out the formation of diastole before it starts. The strains you know now better, available now for made-to-order pitchables at any volume. Contact Omega Yeast today at omegayeast.com. Also, ABS Commercial has been a full-service brewery outfitter for over 10 years. They are proud to offer brew houses, tanks, keg washers, and preventative maintenance parts to brewers across the country, as well as equipment for distilling, cider making, wine making and more they know the ins and outs of the brewing and installation process and can design the perfect setup for you whether you're just starting out or looking to expand contact them today at sales at abs-commercial.com to discuss your customized brewery needs abs commercial we are brewers where do you want to start robert should we talk about hellas or should we start talking about pilsner first 
Uh, let's talk about pills. Okay. Tell me about this pills. Um, you know, again, we're drinking it right now. There is uh, there's a beautiful hop character to mm-hmm. this that seems to um, just kind of ride that herbal floral line somewhere in between, not one or the other, but uh, mm-hmm. you know, it hedges you know with a, a beautiful refinement to it. Um, you know, beautiful color, nice malt character to it. Uh, you know, talk to me about uh, you know, and obviously. The beer was designed before you're here, but you've gotten to play a part in how mm-hmm. uh, you know the, the things get optimized now as you are making a lot more of this uh, award-winning beer. And this is your number one number one beer coming out of the brew house. Yep. Talk to us about uh, you know the brewing uh, the you know maybe we'll start back with ingredients and then we can talk about the process of brewing it too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, the pill the German pills is our uh, our top selling brand. Or I would I think about thirty percent of what we produce is pilsner. So. We're brewing a, right now, at least we're brewing a, There's so a, many, so many craft brewers, like, uh, I know it's pretty fun. Uh, That's why, <laughs> why, can't, why, why can't that be, you know, uh-huh. no, but this is Austin, Texas. Like, yeah. uh, you know, that Pilsner is a lot of people's mm-hmm. number one selling brand. Yep. Yep. Uh, Unless Austin you're buying is a, house where it's electric jellyfish. Right. But. Right. Austin is a, a wonderful lager town. I believe Austin's won four out of the five last, uh, GABF gold medals, um, between ABGB, us and Lazarus. Uh, for German pills. So, so yeah, there's a lot of, a uh, lot of great beer here to get inspiration from. And, um, and you, yeah. have to, you have to bring your A game. That's table stakes to, to getting draft yeah. handles for pills near here in, uh, in Austin, yep. Texas. Mm-hmm. So, um, but yeah, this, uh, this pills is, uh, su- super simple malt base. It's a couple different Weirman pills malts, the, the standard pills and the extra pale. And then, um, uh, a it's couple a, of different pills yeah, malts. We You're blend, blending Weirman. Yeah, you got to get it just right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that seems complex. It's a yeah. What's well, it's a yeah. So it's probably I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but I sure. believe it's somewhere around seventy percent of of uh, regular Weirman pills, and then a little bit of the extra pale, um, which kind of lightens it up a little bit. Maybe adds a little bit more to the sulfur sulfur character of the beer. Um, oh, interesting. Um, yeah, and then we. We have a, uh, our brew house the light, here. The lighter a, produces more sulfur, you find? Uh, yeah, yeah. Huh. Like, um, yeah. And that's, yeah, I think so. But, uh, yeah, our brew house is a, uh, you know, we have a single, uh, well, we have a combination mash lauder vessel. Uh, so we do a little bit of a step mash program, nothing, nothing too complicated, but uh, with the pills, we'll mash in, uh, you know, for like a protein rest and then step it up. Um, but, uh, no decoction, no decoction. Yeah. Not yet. Anyways, uh, maybe, maybe a mash mixer or a mash kettle in the future, but, but not right now. Um, and then, um, we do, we brew the beer a little bit high gravity. So we will, um, you know, we'll knock out into the kettle at, uh, you know, fin- finish topping off the kettle at like 13 Plato, but then, uh, and then run our, you know, boil hops and then add water at the end to kind of target a specific, uh, you know, gravity, knockout gravity to the tank. So that helps with, uh, being able to consistently hit gravity. Um, and then also on some of our other beers that helps to, we can add cold water. It drops the whirlpool. We can add a lot of hops and not necessarily a ton of bitterness. So we can drop the, uh, the whirlpool temperature either a little bit if we're adding hot water or if we add cold water to, to, uh, bring the, the whirlpool temp down, we can add, um, then that, you know, for like a hazy IPA, for instance, uh, we, we can add a lot of hops at like 170 degrees and not pick up a ton of uh, bitterness. Sure, sure. There's definitely that that benefit of cool pulling. Now, you know, obviously, you know, from, as, from a process perspective, you know, uh, as you are packing that much malt into a high gravity brew, there's always that, uh, you know, danger of mm-hmm. over extraction and, you know, tannic character. You know, how do you guys manage for that? I would say it's almost the opposite. Actually, we, we kind of like underutilize the, the mash because we're, uh, not fully running off, uh, if that makes sense. So, you know, a lot, a lot oh, of our, yeah. oh, okay. So you're just taking the, yeah, not that. I'm not sure if that's on purpose actually, but, uh, <laughs> but that's kind of how it works right now is a lot of the beers we're not running to like super low, um, last words on the, on the brew house. So, um, so yeah, maybe that actually helps with, with, with some of the, some of the tannic character, but but then you just have to have a pretty large mash tun in order to handle yeah, that much grain to be able to, you know, stop loudering at a time where you can still keep the gravity. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And we have, we do have steam jackets on the louder ton. So that helps, uh, we can kind of bring the, the mash up to help with, uh, you know, loudering, uh, uh, you know, the viscosity as the temperature comes up, the viscosity drops. And so we can louder a little bit easier. Whereas at Fremont, our, uh, 
we were doing a similar process, but we did not have any way to heat up the the lauder tun. So you, if you mashed in a really dry beer, it just kind of stayed that way until the sparge water heated it up, and that made some laudering uh, quite a bit more complicated or sticky. Yeah. Do you adjust, uh, you know, your your water to to grist ratio at all to to handle this higher gravity piece? Uh, some, I would say, most of our um, most of our mashes are pretty. Uh, thin, you know, or that's something I've, I've actually been working on is try to thicken them up a little bit to get a little bit, uh, higher yield out of our, what we're out of the mash. But, um, but yeah, we're, we generally mash relatively thin, uh, 1.5, uh, quarts per pound right now is, is kind of like the standard number, but. And then, yeah. And so then, uh, you know, you, you get into hot side mm-hmm. and now you're going to talk about hops. Yeah. Uh, so what's the IBU, you know, uh, goal for the Pilsner? We are a uh, target just based on our recipe calculator is somewhere around 28. Um, we just recently tastes a little more bitter than that. Yeah. We thankfully. just, yeah. we just, uh, got some IBU testing materials with We just got a spectrophotometer this past year. And so our uh, lab manager has been working a little bit on checking that. Um, so it does test a little bit higher than that, maybe 30, 31, but, um, but uh, yeah, not not crazy bitter. But it's it not, does. It's not real ale. Hans Pils, right. fifty five <laughs> IBU Pilsner. Right. Yep. That's a bitter one. Um, that being said, it does that, have. That is Joe Stang's favorite Pilsner in the world mm-hmm. now, yeah. just because it is the most bitter. Right. And, uh, he's on he's on a constant search for the most bitter Pilsner nice. that he can find. <laughs> Uh, it's not super high in BUs that it does have over two and a half pounds per barrel and on the hot side. So we put a lot of hops wow, into wow, the okay. uh, pills and that's the, I would say the dominant, uh, aroma character is probably from Saphir. Um, that's, uh, maybe a pound, almost maybe a pound and a quarter, almost a pound and a half of Saphir in the Whirlpool. Um, uh, but then we got a quite a bit of, uh, Tetanang and middle fur as well. So, um, that we put in there to bring it. Uh, so there's, yeah, there's quite a bit of hops in this beer. So two something pounds of hops in the hot side and only 28 to 31 IBUs of bitterness mm-hmm. means that a lot of it's going in very late, pretty late. And then also, um, the German, uh, hop harvest last year, we had just atrociously low, uh, <laughs> alpha. So, you know, our, uh, I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but you know, our, like our Herzbrucker, for instance, is like a 1.1 alpha or, you know, there's a very, very, very low, um, alpha. So we're, we're really actually looking forward to, um, our new German, uh, crop is going to come in here in the next like two weeks, I think, and trying to get the alphas are kind of back up to a little bit normally where they were, you know, in like the threes, high threes, um, for some of these hops. So part of the, the extra so your pounds per barrel will probably go down a little it bit. It will probably to, go down a little bit. Yeah. yeah. There is a, a, you know, a certain amount of like a planty astringency, you know, that I think you get just putting that much, uh, hot material in the beer that I I'm hoping we can kind of adjust it a little bit with the new crop. Do you, did you get some of you, you get some of that now, or, uh, I mean, I, or what have you done to kind of mitigate around that? Because you're right. That's a lot of we, uh, plant material. Just from the building. sort of original recipe, we ended up putting more, trying to drop some of the, um, those later hops and then, or drop, dropping the, you know, if we were just using middle fruit to bitter, um, we'd end up using, you know, way too much, uh, T nineties, um, just in general. So we, we use a, um, a higher alpha German variety to, um, it's not heel melon or mandarina, but, um, uh, but we use a higher alpha, uh, to kind of add that sort of like starting BU mm. level in the, at the, you know, at the 60 minute mark I have, uh, just recently, it's not quite finished yet. It's in, I believe it's going to be in bright tank this week, but I'm experimenting with the uh, Haas product flex, um, which is like a, you know, standardized, um, bittering flowable mm-hmm. extract. Which, and I haven't actually used it in a lager before, but for, um, you know, like a West coast IPA, I found it, I find it adds like a very nice, super crisp, super clean bitterness. So, Hmm. um, I am curious to try dropping a little bit of the, uh, you know, just general T90 load of this beer and, and kind of boost up the, that kind of like base bitterness with the, with that CO2 extract. So you do some initial bittering then, and then you know, is there anything in between or do you go then straight into Whirlpool? Uh, in the existing recipe there, yeah, we've got a 60 minute hop edition, a 30, there's a 15, a yeah. 10, uh, and Whirlpool or sorry, a 10, a five and a Whirlpool. So building the full range. Of, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. My, uh, yeah. The meanwhile, uh, hop 
like f- philosophy is definitely like lots of um lots of additions you know uh, across the whole to kind of like build in these layers of of hop character so have you tried it without i mean uh you know obviously whatever it is is working for mm-hmm. you there's no reason to to not do it that way uh not here i mean w- maybe with some of our other recipes we we have but not not for this uh this particular brand yeah once you kind of like build up a brand it's a few years old it's hard to make like you know major changes or this you know simplification of it or the kind of you don't want to I don't want to come in here and be the new guy and be accused of like stripping all the beers down. And you know what I mean? <laughs> sure. 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 Yeah. Process improvements are great, but yeah. uh, don't mess with we the beer We want to keep itself. the beer tasting awesome. And, um, but yeah, I think to some extent that more is not always better. Right. So, right. Mm-hmm. What's uh? what do you, how, you know, what's your whirlpool whirlpool process look like then mm-hmm. on that? Are you cool pulling the, uh, the, uh, uh, German Pilsner or do you just you know, hot, use a hot whirlpool with that one? Uh, we do not cool pool the German pills. We, we do, like I mentioned earlier, you know, we'll lauder off. We'll, we'll probably end up adding something like two barrels to a, you know, 17 barrels of wort. Right. Um, uh, so it's not the, an extreme high gravity brew by yeah, any yeah, chance. It's, it's a yeah, very mellow. It's, mo- it's a pretty, it's like a one Plato gravity adjustment. Yeah. Um, and so with the pills, we're, we will add hot water. So it does actually have the effect of dropping the whirlpool temperature a little bit, um, but not as much as, so I don't, I assume maybe we'll get less uh, whirlpool utilization just from that, maybe even like 10 degrees of drop, mm. uh, but it's not what you would think of as a, you know, like a 175 hazy IPA cool pool. Sure. Sure. Um, how, how long does that whirlpool tend to go for? Um, you know, I'm just curious cause mm-hmm. you know, we talk about whirlpooling, but then there's, you know, there's somewhere it's a very, very short, uh, contact. If, mm-hmm. it's, if it's a small system, yours is a 15 barrel. Mm-hmm. So there's decent time, but it's not the same kind of runoff, uh, whirlpool time as, uh, you know, somebody on a much larger system that's, uh, you know, that, you know, where there might be longer con- hop contact time should probably couch all of this, all of the t- same time talking like that time is only relative to the size of the system and all of these other pieces For that sure. go along with that. Yeah, the whirlpool uh, rest. Uh, you know, I might I might be wrong on this, but I believe it's about is a twenty minute whirlpool rest before okay. we cast out to the uh, fermenter, uh, and then our cast out will take somewhere in the range of thirty to forty minutes. You know, depending on on the brand. Some sometimes the time of year here, the groundwater coming in is cooler, so that extends our lager knockouts, especially. But um, but yeah, so total time in the whirlpool is is maybe a little bit more than an hour. A decent amount of contact time mm-hmm. for for those hops in the whirlpool, yeah, and some potential for isomerization at least at the mm-hmm. the, the top end of that, yeah, yeah. yeah. So then uh, let's talk about uh, fermentation, right? Um, we this isn't a dry hopped pilsner, right? It is not. No, yeah, yeah it does. Uh, it has quite a bit of hop character, but it's all that's just all whirlpool sure. hot side. Um, so the we use Augustiner uh, as our kind of house uh, lager strain so augustine team augustine huh? yeah. <laughs> okay okay uh-huh yeah we we really like the uh it's the character yeah the character of it the the like sulfur and the ester profile of it uh is quite nice um so we uh, what do you like about that sulfur and ester profile that um we it's got a um I, I just think it really brings out the, uh, the hop character, especially the pills. Um, cause you've now said positive things about sulfur twice now, mm-hmm. <laughs> as, I, as I've noticed and not that I'm counting or keeping track, Yeah, that's um, interesting. but, but it's always, in, that is an interesting and polarizing you know, piece. There are some lager brewers mm-hmm. that are not big fans of sulfur and obviously, yeah. you know, there's different kinds of sulfur. We're talking about that very yeah. pleasant, uh, matchstick, uh, kind of sulfur, not, right. not the, you know, funky eggy sulfur, mm-hmm. but, uh, you know, but yeah, so there's something to that, that, uh, you all are actually optimizing and building the recipe around. I've, yeah, personally, I find, uh, a lot of sulfur, you know, too much sulfur obviously is, is not, is not great, but, um, I think the sulfur character of a lager really kind of sharpens it up. It can make it more, you know, more bright, more drinkable. Um, and to me is, uh, you know, is an indication of freshness too. You know, you have a beer sit around too long, uh, that sulfur is completely gone and it can be a little flabby, I think. So I think it, uh, yeah, I do like, uh, a, a restrained amount, but yeah, I understand not, not everyone feels like that, but yeah, we're definitely not doing, uh, I mean, you know, I'm, with, I, I'm, pers- I'm personally with you on that. And I yeah. agree with you. Like when, when you start tasting too much malt in your Pilsner and mm-hmm. it doesn't, or, you know, what you want is that, that sulfur along with those hops, adding that structure to it that uh, mm-hmm. allows for a, a more full malt expression. And so that these beers don't end up thin and just, you know, 
characterless. Like yeah. they shouldn't mm-hmm. be that way. They should have enough heft to them to hold up to uh, the flavors that you're pushing into them via hops. And Absolutely. so, uh, yeah. So Augustiner, but it all it has its own, uh, you know, fun quirks of fermentation. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, we, let's see. So we cast out to the tank at about 52, um, and we'll, we'll ferment this beer at 54. So maybe a little bit on the, you know, kind of middle, middle temperature for a lager. Mm-hmm. Um, and it takes us about, uh, two weeks, I guess, to get through fermentation. We do a free, we do do a free rise, um, you know, a little bit more than halfway through fermentation. And then we also will spun the tank up, uh, one Play-Doh before, before terminal, uh, should to, also mention that you are, uh, conical ferment, cylindro conical mm-hmm. fermenters, yep, yep. not yeah horizontal lagering tanks. Yep. Yep. Um, so we currently are, uh, we'll, we'll spun the tank. We're, we're looking for, uh, you know, a certain amount of days of stable gravity. And then we are, as of, you know, a few months ago, we've started using a, uh, analytical method in our lab to check for, for diacetyl. So to kind of like pass the, the, uh, the beer on to, to crash. So generally when I first started here, you know, we were, uh, that was roughly taking like 17, 18 days, um, just to pass sort of like a sensory test. Um, and then as we started testing, uh, with the lab method, you know, we were getting to like very, very low numbers, you know, within 14, 15 or so. So, um, so we're able to cut a little bit of tank time and actually give, give it more cold time, which I think is, is beneficial. So we've started, um, uh, we crash around day, uh, 14 and then the, these, our loggers are not, uh, loggered a huge amount of time. We'll give it about, uh, like seven, eight days in the fermenter crashed in, at 30 degrees. And then, um, it gets transferred to a bright tank, uh, with, we use biofine. Um, and then it spends another, you know, roughly a week in the bright tank and then we're packaging it, uh, from there. And we try to, um, I find that they're still a little green at that point. So we end up, um, having it sit in keg, you know, for about another week at least before we end up releasing it for sale. So a multi three stage lager yeah. process <laughs> where it's sitting cold, uh, you know, but in various, uh, mm-hmm. various formats. Yeah. Is there anything, I mean, obviously the Pilsner is a delicate beer and you know, there's lots of ways and chances you know, for it to get screwed up along the way. Mm-hmm. Is there anything to the, the uh, process and handling of that beer, especially through transfers that mm-hmm. uh, you pay particular attention to in order to, to, you know, keep it gentle. So we do that. We do the, the spund step, which builds a lot of, uh, you know, natural carbonation. I think we probably are somewhere a little bit higher than two volumes of carbonation by the time we end up transferring it. Uh, we do pump, you know, we use a centrifugal pump to transfer to the bright tank. Um, which I think is, is, uh, pr- pretty gentle, but, um, and then, um, yeah, in the bright tank, we will carbonate with a with a carbonation stone. Uh, as basically as a, it's a fairly slow process. We'll we um, start injecting CO two through the carb stone, you know, at like a pretty low rate, as, and then as the uh, head pressure sort of stabilizes, we keep turning it up, you know, one to two psi at a time while checking it. So the, rather than sort of like bleeding off uh, headspace as we're carbonating, um, we're sort of like slowly letting the beer equalize to to that, uh, carbonation set point, which, you know, for our, this beer is around like two seven five or so. Um, so that I would say, uh, compared to what I was used to in the past, the carbonation is, is a little bit, is fairly gentle here hmm. and a little, you know, it might take like a whole day basically to carbonate a bright tank. Yeah. Interesting. Anything else to the, the kind of, you know, process that you, you know, have, uh, you know, found interesting about the way that, that meanwhile, while you help the way that you all make this beer, uh, or anything that you've tr- been trying to, you know, uh, round corners on or sharpen up or, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and otherwise, uh, you know, make, make small, uh, you know, adjustments to. Yeah. I think, um, not, nothing's really coming to mind right now, uh, beyond what we already talked about. Uh, I will say there's certainly a, a um, uh, uh, I'm used to having a centrifuge, you know, as a clarification tool and <laughs> sure, it's sure. having, a, having to, uh, you know, wait for the beer to clear up, um, is, is sometimes challenging, you know, cause uh, if you're a brewer, you know, that doesn't happen as consistently as you want it, even if you do everything exactly the same every time. And, um, so yeah, that's so something you're having to learn some patience around all of this. Yeah. And just, uh, you know, it's, it's like, a uh, pro- there's a lot of, uh, 
you know, technical things that go into, uh, hay stability findings rates and, uh, things like that. Um, so we're, we're, you know, we're kind of in the process of working on trying to optimize those things as well, but. And it has to be tight. I mean, you are pushing a lot of turns out of this brew house in any given week and Mm -hmm. trying to maximize the the production, um, you know, given the demand for the beer and the, that kind of growth and meeting those goals. And, uh, um, you know, if it takes an extra day or two to clear up, then that that messes up everything, uh, downstream. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It can be challenging, but at the end of the day, the, the beer quality is the most important thing. You know, we, we will, we will miss sales before sending a beer out that's not ready. So, um, so yeah, we're, uh, it's a definitely a challenging thing about being in a growing brewery environment is kind of balancing the holding to your quality standards while also trying to maintain that, you know, 40, 50, 60% growth. Um, but we've, we've got a, uh, a super solid, uh, quality manager here that's been working on that. Uh, and then my personal background is quality and we're, you know, we're, we've got, um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not particularly worried about anything, you know, going, going off the rails or anything. We've got a really solid structure here. So sure. Well, let's talk a little bit about, uh, you know, the points of difference for Hellas, just out of curiosity, before we do that, the latest product from Yakima chief hops, YCH 702 is a flowable extract designed to maximize aroma and increase whirlpool yield. YCH 702 is flowable at room temperature standardized to 20% total oil and contains a high concentration of survivable hop compounds, which increases the chances of the aroma showing up in the final beer. One kilogram of YCH 702 equates to 10 kilograms of T90 pellets. YCH 702 Citra, Mosaic, Simcoe, and Sabro are available. Contact your Yakima Chief Hops rep for more information. And if you're a brewer who's also interested in distilling, subscribe now to the Craft Spirits and Distilling Podcast, available on all of your favorite podcast platforms. Hosted by Sydney Jones, head distiller for Few Spirits in Chicago, and Molly Troop, master distiller for Freeland Spirits in Portland, Oregon. This podcast explores the technical and creative processes behind great spirits through conversations with some of the leading distillers working today. It's everything you love about the Craft Beer and Brewing Podcast, but focused on distilling. Click on the link in the show notes to give it a listen. All right. So, Robert, where, uh, you know, if we, if we talk about Hellas for a little bit, um, where are the, you know, spots, you know, relative to Pilsner where uh, Hellas uh, finds a little bit of difference? And I imagine it starts somewhere probably in Mall. Uh, the Malt is relatively similar, actually. Huh, you know, we, we, use still a, blend. we use a blend of the pills and extra premium, uh, the pale, pale pills. I don't have the exact split here, but it's, it's fairly close. Um, you know, like yeah. a 70, 30, roughly we do, we do actually kind of a step, what, what is kind of a step mash on the Hellas. Um, so we'll mash in at one thirty uh, two, uh, with our, into our combination mash lauder ton. And then, uh, we'll leave that for 20 minutes and then we'll bring it up to, uh, 148, uh, for another 20 minutes and then we'll bring it to mash out at 165. So that there's a small, small process, uh, difference there. I, you know, this, that was, uh, worked on a little bit before I got here, but I think there's some, um, you know, feeling that it adds a little bit of maybe malt complexity, um, that we wouldn't get just going straight to, to 148 or 150 right at the mm. beginning. Makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, what are, what are any other, other differences? What's the next, uh, kind of point of difference do you think? I mean, the, uh, uh, the minerality I would say is quite a bit lower than our pills, you know, so we, we dropped the sulfate quite a bit. Um, yeah, so we're, our just general salts addition, you know, we want it to be a little bit softer. Uh, the hop hops are, are, uh, obviously in a Hellas. We want those to be quite a bit lower than our pills sure, at sure. two and a half pounds per barrel. But I would say our Hellas has a solid amount of bitterness. It's definitely not yeah. like a sweet, um, right. a sweet, overly malty beer. It's pretty, pretty dry. It's got like a crisp, crisp bitterness. Um, but not so much like late hop floral character. Uh, it's kind of a, like a really sort of delicate, um, you know, red apple kind of, uh, hop character. Uh, and that one, our Hellas is, uh, I would say the primary aroma from Hellas is from Herzbrecher. Um, hmm. and then we also have a little bit of middle fruit in there. And a little bit of uh, perla as well for bittering. Yeah. But yeah, we're really shooting for a lot. only, our calculator says 16, I believe 16 IBUs, but I believe when we tested it recently, it was a little bit higher than that, maybe 20, 22 or so. Mm-hmm. No, that's reasonable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> 
What do you what do you think that you know? And then fermentation is pretty similar, I, I assume. Yeah, pretty Almost much identical. Pretty yeah. much uh, identical fermentation. Yeah. yeah. Are are those are the helisops added more on hot side or, or sorry not more on during the boil um, with less whirlpool addition? I, I would just assume, but maybe I shouldn't assume. Uh, there's a there's still a whirlpool addition. Um, you know, it's about a uh, maybe a third of a pound per barrel at Herzbrucker. Mm. Uh, so a decent one. And then we've got a 30 minute, uh, 30 minute and, uh, you know, 60 minutes. So a little bit less additions, uh, less total, the total pounds is really, uh, less, you know, maybe like 0.75 pounds per barrel or so yeah. for that beer. Yeah. Uh, or, you know, on this one, we're also operating with like a Herzbrecker 1.1 alpha and a middle for one, 1. 1.8. So, <laughs> yeah. Oof. Oof. Yeah. So maybe, you know, and instead of trying to talk more about recipe there, we talk about, you know, what it takes to make an excellent gold medal winning Hellas, mm -hmm. a gold, a Hellas that can stand up to, you know, excellent beers from around the world in this Hellas category. Absolutely. You know, what do you, and as we know, like the ingredient, the, you know, the recipe is one thing and process and handling is so much, you know, a key of this. It's mm -hmm. not, it's not one, you know, uh, you know, thing that's the smoking gun. It's a lot of things together that make for, uh, you know, an award-winning beer. Yeah. You know, as you kind of like think about it broadly, what do you think some of the things that you'll do are that help make it such a excellent beer? Um, I think a lot of just, I think what's, what's wonderful about, um, Pilsner and Hellas and, and lager brewing is it's so, uh, process focused, you know, like, um, all, uh, every the brewing, brewing is such a complicated process and every step of the way you can introduce some little bit of, uh, a change or something negative, you know, and, um, w really we just have a, I think the, the most important part of our beer is the, the brewing team that we have that works here is very, very proud of what they do and, and, uh, and do a, a really just a fantastic job. You know, they're, they're, uh, uh, really, uh, just always want to like make the best, best beer they can possibly make. Um, so, Part of it, I think that's that's really a lot of it is, um, you know, there's just so much care that goes into to every little step. Um, and that, you know, goes from brewing to fermentation. I think yeast, you know, we put a lot of effort into yeast management here. Mm -hmm. um, John, our uh, our lab manager, or sometimes if a brewer is assisting him, you know, we'll end up doing like, uh, like six yeast counts in one day to, you know, get the pitch right. And we, you know, are checking the yeast pitch rate after we, we end up knocking out and adjusting, adjusting if necessary. Um, that's a pretty, I think I personally believe yeast management is a hugely critical part of, of good lager brewing. Um, and then, um, yeah, just, uh, also just kind of paying attention to the, something I appreciate about uh, what we do here is like every single day we're doing gravities, we're tasting the beer, we're making, we're making notes on that. We're looking out for, you know, differences, uh, just trying to like get, not just tasting the beer at the very end of the process, but kind of seeing, seeing what it does. Like as we, as we, uh, go through fermentation and, and packaging, et cetera. And, and then all of our, all of our beers get tasted right now at, um, 15, 30 and 45 days as well. So we do quite a bit of, uh, sensory as well, you know, post, post packaging. Interesting. Interesting. Well, let's talk about IPA now, uh, too, uh, and shift gears. Mm -hmm. Another, another style that, uh, you know, especially with this West coast or again, San Diego style. <laughs> 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 oh man. I love it. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe we should start, you know, calling it, you know, San Diego style, uh, you know, Oakland or, you know, right. uh, Bay area style, okay, real specific. Portland style, mm -hmm. Seattle <laughs> style. I mean, you know, right. Is it, uh, I mean, cause Portland IPA is act is actually a little different than a lot of San Diego style. And then of course the, the Bay area, mm -hmm. um, you know, crushes it and definitely has their own little tweaks, I think on that yep, San Diego yep, yep. style. So, mm -hmm. um, let's pull it all apart. Like let's blow up West coast IPA into all of the, the little subsets and sub genres. Sure. Um, but let's talk about, uh, yeah, let's talk about secret beach, you know, San Diego style IPA, obviously with Will coming out of the breakside, the uh, school, um, you know, IPA, uh, Breakside made so many award-winning IPAs over the years. Mm -hmm. uh, it was kind of cool to see. Meanwhile, also come and uh, you know, uh, you know, come out strong. You know, in that in those same kind of, uh, and I should say, this is like American Strong Pale Ale. I think mm -hmm. is the category that yep. it won in. Um, 
let's talk about the kind of the like the some of the fundamentals of Meanwhile's approach to West Coast or San Diego style IPA. Absolutely. Um, what you guys consider some of these kind of you know fundamental tenets, you know some of the kind of core consistencies through these, um, and you know in terms of malt and process, then mm-hmm. uh, you know how you all think about hops and integrate different uh, blends of hops to make different iterations of these beers. But maybe you know maybe we'll start with some of the kind of fundamentals. Uh, you know some of the what your base you know San Diego style IPA tends to look like. Yeah. So uh, Secret Beach is a um, it's a little bit uh, on the lower ABV side for a uh, IPA, so uh, it comes in about six point two percent. We're trying to make something, you know, that's drinkable, especially here in Texas. It's super hot all summer, so you can't just be making like a big sweet, you know, seven and a half percent beer. No, no one really wants to drink those. So, um, so they need to drink a lot of whatever it is. And yeah. So it's got to be smaller <laughs> so they can drink yeah. a few of them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So our uh, yeah Secret Beach starts with. Uh, uh, Pilsner malt base. Uh, we use, uh, a Canada pills, which is just super clean, uh, great base to, to build from. I love it that, that you use this Canada pills base malt for, for really is base malt for all your ales. Pretty much. Yeah. Pretty much all of what our, what do you uh, love about using that kind of light Pilsner malt for all that? You know, we get, uh, I think some, some base malts can add sort of a grainy character. That's a little distracting, you know, for, uh, for a West Coast IPA or, or, or even a hazy where you just want the sort of hops to shine through. Uh, so this Canada Pills that we use is really uh, super neutral. It doesn't, uh, it's, a, it's a great platform to kind of build things from. Um, so we, yeah, we start with, uh, with Canada Pills. We add a little bit, also a blend of uh, Munich malts, uh, secret blend. Um, secret blend yeah. of Munich malts. <laughs> I'm intrigued. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, just to kind of, you know, build up the, the malt character a little bit, you mm-hmm. know, we don't, we, uh, secret beach is definitely not like a super, uh, pale, like just hops, you know, it does have right. some, some, uh, malt quality to it. And then, uh, yeah, we, we also put in a relatively aggressive mineral profile in there for like a, a pretty heavy sulfate four to one sulfate to chloride ratio. Mm. Um, but as in terms of uh, brew house, uh, we you know mash in. We're kind of targeting like a after hop creep somewhere in the uh, like high twos, low threes uh, for a terminal gravity. Uh, so we mash in kind of in a you know one fifty four, one fifty five range, um, and then um, yeah, we're uh, we we kind of do. Lauder with the same process I mentioned earlier. That's a little slightly, bit yeah, you're right. That's slightly f- more full for you know mm-hmm. a beer in that six point two percent range. Yeah, a lot of the you know di- the rotator IPAs that we're making now are kind of you know dropping the terminal, but the Secret Beach occupies like a little bit more of a, a fuller space, I think, than since some of the newer beers are making. It's like a transitional West yeah. Coast IPA. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, somewhere between old and new. Yeah, a lot of the you know. You, you go to maybe San Diego. Maybe or you, that's why it wins some medals. Right. That's interesting. <laughs> yeah. You found the judge's number on that one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, it's uh, uh, the, the IPA, you know, Austin, there's a lot of lager breweries around here. Uh, the, the sort of like clear IPA brewers recently have been like on the relatively multi side. So Secret Beach compared to those, those beers is definitely um, – significantly less sweet, less specialty malt, uh, but it still is not quite like a, you know, just Pilsner malt and dextrose kind of, kind of beer. It's got, it's got yeah. some tooth to it. So. Yeah. Cool. So, uh, so then single infusion malt mash for that one. Uh, we do, um, yeah, like a one fifty four um, mash rest and then, and then we will mash out, you know, after a, after a 20 minute rest. And then, yeah, we run through this, a similar process. We'll, we will lauder a little bit high gravity, um, and then, uh, you know, we add our boil hops, uh, late hops, and then we on Secret Beach we do uh, the cool pool. So we'll, when we top off to hit our actual gravity target, we'll use cold water instead of hot water. What uh, are you hopping throughout that one, or are you just pushing it, most of it uh, to the tail end? Uh, yes, that one is uh, yeah similar kind of hop regime. We got a sixty, a thirty, a ten, a and a, so a bunch of world classic. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, yeah. And that, I mean, we've got a pretty, it seems like too much work for your brewers, Robert. <laughs> yeah. They're, they don't complain about it. I oh, don't know why. Fair, yeah. fair enough. <laughs> uh, secret beach is a, is definitely like a, 
uh, brewer favorite beer, which is awesome to see. You know, like our one of our best selling beers is also the beer that beers that the brewers really love to drink after work. So yeah, yeah. So you stick to that because obviously it's it's providing some sort of breadth of of hop character that you like. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think uh, yeah, just kind of this. Uh, you know, layering of different character. Seeger Beach has, uh, we bitter with Columbus, which I think is, uh, you know, adds a relatively like sharp, uh, quality of bitterness. And then, uh, we've got the kind of like towards the end of the boil, the, the 10 and the whirlpool are going to be Citra, uh, Idaho seven cryo. We use quite a bit of that in Seeger Beach. And then Idaho seven cryo. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. We've got a, it's one of our actually like most, uh, contracted hops is hmm. Idaho seven cryo. Uh, and then we use Amarillo. It's got all those survivables, man. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, <laughs> that must be it. It's right up there on the, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, we do a little bit of Amarillo as well in the, mm. in the hot side, uh, which our Amarillo here is very, really nice. It's got like a very cool stone fruit character. So I think mm. that, uh, kind of definitely adds to that beer. Cool. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you mentioned whirlpooling, cool pooling, mm-hmm. you know, in that 170 ish range down there, mm-hmm. similar kind of timing on a hop stand is the Pilsner. Yep. Yep. Same. Yeah. Um, pretty much, uh, aside from the, the temperature of the water that we, you know, water up with the, the process there is pretty much all the same. Cool. Cool. How much, you know, how much hops in general go into the secret beach on the uh, hot side? We're roughly two pounds per barrel. Um, and then, yeah, we're going to do another two and a half to three of dry hop. Oh, geez. Okay. So it's, there's a good amount of For of a 6.2% yeah. finished beer. <laughs> okay. That's a lot of hops. Yep. Yeah. Well, let's then, uh, you know, talk about, uh, you know, the, that post whirlpool fermentation, you know, mm-hmm. kind of process. Yeah. Uh, so secret beach, we use, uh, Chico, uh, to ferment. We're going to ferment that at 68. Um, it takes, uh, about uh, so we're going to, on the sixth day, we're going to dump yeast or harvest yeast. Um, and then we're going to dry hop and then we dry hop warm. And then we're sort of riding out, uh, warm. What do you mean by warm? Oh, uh, at that same temperature. So okay. at, at 68, uh, so we don't do any kind of free rise, but especially here, most of the year it's warmer than 68 in the brewery. So the beer will probably be roughly in that 67, 68 range. We put, uh, all for secret beach at least we have a single dry hop that, that that's at yeah roughly two and a half pounds per barrel we put it put it in there and then we're uh at that point watching for stable gravity so we do see a, a pretty good amount of uh of hop creep uh so we'll see somewhere between like a maybe a half play-doh maybe a little bit more of gravity drop after we put the hops in um and then we're looking for uh like now with, with the analytical method for VDK, we're looking for a stable gravity and then also, a you know, a, a sub threshold VDK number as well to come back from the lab before we crash it. And so that can take, you know, sometimes it takes almost as much as our loggers take, you know, it can take, uh, hmm. 14, 17 days to get to sort of a stable VDK number. Doesn't sound like you're uh, using enough ALDC. Yeah. Then. <laughs> <laughs> we do actually. So yeah, I skipped that part. We do add, uh, it's actually a project we're working on at the moment. We are, we were putting ALDC in at cast out, like on the way to the fermenter. And then we put it in at dry hop. Um, but when we started doing our, uh, analytical testing, it wasn't really seeming that different to me than what I'm used to seeing without, uh, every month we did not use any ALDC. So, um, we've been experimenting, kind of removing it slowly and seeing what the effect is. And, um, yeah, so that's kind of an ongoing project, but we are, ALDC is pretty expensive. So we're working on trying to use a little bit less of it. You can go back and listen to the White Labs episode I did with uh, Julian and Garrison and Chris White. Uh, okay, yeah, that was pretty recent, right? Yeah, it was pretty recent. Mm-hmm. And uh, they talked a lot about trying to, um, you know, promoting yeast health, especially using zinc in order to offset and mm-hmm. drive more fermentation. And it's actually had this nice side effect of decreasing their ALDC budget and use. Interesting. And so, yeah. uh, so there's something to it right there. Kind of, mm-hmm. kind of interesting to, to watch all that. Kinda. Yeah. When you all dry hop, um, do you, you dry hop all at once? Uh, you stage things out and you know, how are you, are you doing anything to kind of, you know, promote, uh, extraction? Mm-hmm. And- uh, with secret beach, we put it all in at once and then we will do a, you know, a CO2 rouse the, over the next two days. Mm-hmm. Um, so we basically pressurize a keg and then sort of like blast a huge bubble of CO2 in, mm-hmm. uh, over the subsequent two days after we dry hop. Um, so that's how that 
you know, relatively simple process there. Some, some other brands are like one-offs. We've definitely, um, used like a two stage dry hop, either, you know, d- add the hops, do the rouse, then dump the hops off, add more, more hops, or we've done a, uh, sort of like a temperature drop, uh, from the first stage to the second stage to get maybe a little bit of a different character. Mm. Um, uh, there's a beer on the board right now that we, or th- that we dry hopped with, uh, Nelson, uh, you know, so we'll, we'll do like a, you know, our main dry hop, uh, you know, on day six and then day eight, we'll drop it to 50 degrees, do the kind of like a quick, uh, Nelson dry hop. And then once VDK is good, which usually at that low temperature, we're not seeing much hop creep, we can crash the beer pretty quick and get those, uh, hops out of there that can get a little funky if they hang out too long. So. So lower temperature dry hop for Nelson. Yeah. <laughs> it gets its own special. I wouldn't treatment. say we always do that, but just as an example, we did that recently. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. And how is that well, like, what would the ben- what's the benefit of doing it that way other than, you know, maintaining a dry hop temperature? Mm-hmm. Uh, I think the lower temperature dry hops add, be- I think it's because there's less just yeast activity. We get more of like a hop sulfur character, mm-hmm. um, like more of like a, sharp uh you know maybe more of that sort of like onion garlic more um those types of compounds stick around whereas like you put hops in at 768 degrees uh, and then the, the, the fermentation is still going there's like co2 evolving from the beer i think it can strip out some of those some of those things which is positive i think it could be positive or negative you know depending on what, what you're looking for yeah so you can i think it's a tool you can use to um if you're looking for like a, a lot of like sweet uh, berry fruit character, you know, that's like a, getting that sort of like hop creep dry hop, I think helps with that. But if you want a little more like, uh, dank, uh, you know, stinky hop character, uh, keeping, keeping the temperature a little bit low and not having the, the sort of like fermentation be ongoing, um, is, uh, is a little bit beneficial. Interesting. Anything to, to how you finish it from there? Post dry hop. Uh, yeah, we're at that point, we're just kind of waiting for things to to calm down and and then yeah we crash crash the crash ips to 30 we don't leave them quite as long as a as a logger you know we'll keep it at 30 degrees for three days or so and then transfer to the bright tank we do biofine as well um and then that will you know settle out in in bright for uh you know f- four or five days so it's still a longer conditioning process even for those mm-hmm. all right yeah. that's why you have so many bright tanks out yeah. there <laughs> <laughs> yep. So you don't have a centrifuge yet. <laughs> you don't know. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, you know, anything to the, the way that you blend hops in your, uh, San Diego IPAs. Mm-hmm. The, so secret beach specifically is, um, Citra and Idaho seven are kind of the dominant, uh, mm-hmm. dominant hops. We also use a, a little bit of Rakao, uh, New Zealand hop. Huh. Um, and that's kind of, I would say a, a common, uh, meanwhile thing is like, couple big, uh, you know, Northwest hops and a little sprinkle of New Zealand in there. So a lot of our beers just kind a of little follow bit. that. Just, yeah. a, just, just a touch. <laughs> yeah. Just a skosh. Yep. Um, what do you, what do you find that it uh, adds to the beers? Uh, I mean, it really depends on the hop, right? Right. Uh, right. But, um, yeah, it's kind of, it depends on, I would say we're, we're, when we, when we're making a beer, we're, we're kind of thinking about what the flavor profile wants to, you know, what we want it to be. And, um, and thinking about what things go well together, you know, like, uh, secret beach has a, I think a pretty cool combination of sort of like this, uh, berry, berry character, as well as, a a, a good amount of like dank, you know, hop sulfur from the Idaho seven. I think, uh, especially when it's super fresh that, that like Idaho seven character is strong. And then as it gets to be 30, 45 days old, there's a little more berry, uh, notes to it and a little, you know, more on the sort of fruity side. So so it changes over time after packaging. Oh yeah. Of course. Interesting. Yeah. 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 Cool. Any other, uh, you know, particular iterations of San Diego or West coast style IPA that, uh, that have been particularly fun, you know, for you to, to work on the, over the last number of months. Yeah. We have, um, a beer that we just released called edible colors. Uh, we used a lot of hops in this one, but the, uh, we've been experimenting a little bit more with, um, like CO2 extract tins, late, mm-hmm. late edition. So so we made a, uh, a double IPA a little while back. We used Simcoe CO2 late. Um, so like three tins in a 15 barrel batch, you know, like at the 10 minute mark, um, which I find adds like a, a, t- a definitely a different hop quality than you get from a um, T90. So you're not getting any of that, uh, like, you know, like 
a sulfur, hop sulfur. It's all like this kind of rich berry mouthfeel uh, that you get from like a, you know, almost like oily resinous quality. Um, so we've been playing around with that. So yeah, Edible Colors has a Simcoe CO2 extract in it as well. Um, and that one's got regular Simcoe T90 and Mosaic and a little bit of Nectaron. And then one of the batches, we snuck in some Rawaka. So <laughs> that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Cryo flowable CO2 extracts. You guys are, are definitely, uh, you know, on the, uh, not afraid to, to use some mm-hmm. of the, the modern hot products. Yeah. I mean, they all, I think they all add a, a different thing, you know, and you wouldn't want to use probably in most cases, wouldn't want to use just one of one thing, but, um, they all have, they all add a, a certain thing that can be really helpful to the, to the beer. Cool. Cool. Well, let's zoom out here at the end and let's, uh, let's keep the conversation focused on, you know, this kind of broader idea of quality. Um, you know, it's been something you focused on for your entire brewing career from Fremont and now here. Um, it's something that, uh, you know, uh, the meanwhile team is, is deeply focused on building that same kind of, uh, reputation and approach to quality and building beers that are both noteworthy and, uh, you know, uh, on the, the judges radar and also, mm-hmm. you know, out there and appealing to, to drinkers here. And, uh, you know, that quality extends not just from the beer to the, you know, but also to the experience that you want people to have when they come and visit the, the brewery itself here. Um, you know, from your perspective and your history, what are, you know, what are, you know, a couple of the just, you know, key points, you know, that, uh, you know, you think drive some of the, the, that biggest, uh, gains mm-hmm. in quality, you know, some of the things that the, you know, those kind of, uh, you know, crux points, yeah. you know, that, uh, you know, become either the biggest places where brewers otherwise, you know, start losing a little bit of quality that they shouldn't lose or mm-hmm. that, uh, you know, they're passing up opportunities to increase the, uh, the quality of what they do. What are some of those, you know, kind of key points? Sure. Um, I believe the, uh, a huge one, especially for a smaller operation, that's a little bit more challenging to work with is yeast management. You know, yeast is the yeast even with like such a hop forward styles, yeast uh, can really affect beer in a negative way. You know, if it's not treated properly and uh, sometimes it's expensive, you know, to like right now we have the benefit of we're brewing pills every week and we're brewing secret beach every week. And so we can kind of keep the yeast going at a pretty good clip. But if you're only brewing every couple of weeks, um, that can be, that can be hard to, uh, you know, have like a healthy yeast culture and, um, so yeast, yeast management is, is uh, super, super critical in my opinion. And then I think um, just, you know, I've spent a lot of my career getting really into sort of nitty gritty technical things about, you know, packaging quality and, um, and you know, chemical analysis in the lab and things like that. But really just tasting beers is so important um, and, and everyone, everyone can do that. And uh, tasting, like I said, we, we taste beer, uh, every day, you know, that it's in the tank and, and we taste beer like over the course of the shelf life. And we, uh, we talk, you know, part of that, uh, tasting process is also a discussion. So we're talking, you know, the brewers, uh, the brewing team will be, will taste all the beer and we'll kind of be talking about how we can always make it better. So, um, I think it's easy to just sort of, uh, sit back and keep doing the same thing you've been doing, um, for a long time, but I think it's important to kind of constantly be thinking like, how can I make this Pilsner just a little bit better? You know, like what's, what can we, what can we, what can we keep doing to, uh, to adjust it? Um, and always be having that mindset, like what's, this is a great beer. It's, you know, yeah, it's one, uh, uh, GABF gold, but how can we make it better than that? Um, so keep, you know, uh, having that mindset where we just are never 100% satisfied. How can we make this thing 1% better, you know, every month or whatever constant engagement and mm-hmm. constant improvement mm-hmm. and uh yeah and staying that tightly engaged with the, every single batch of every single beer that you make well yeah. it's a heavy burden but uh you all are doing a great job with it thank you and i think that is a great place to bring this to a close choose gd chillers on your next expansion or brewery startup and receive one free year of remote control and monitoring take your operations to the next level with the experts at pro brew Old Orchard is the go-to source for fruit to forward ingredients for some of the biggest names in the craft brewing landscape. Omega Yeast's Diacetyl Knockout Series is comprised of eight familiar yeast strains engineered to knock out the formation of diacetyl before it starts. 
ABS Commercial are proud to offer brew houses, tanks, keg washers, and preventative maintenance parts to brewers across the country. YCH702 is a flowable extract designed to maximize aroma and increase whirlpool yield. And if you're a distiller or curious about it, check out the Craft Spirits and Distilling Podcast. If you've enjoyed this one, go to beerandbrewing.com, click on that subscribe button, become a Craft Beer and Brewing subscriber if you're not already. And if you're a professional, please check out our Brewing Industry Guide subscriptions as well as our All Access subscriptions that uh, allow you access to all the great video classes that we film with brewers around the country, including some right here in Austin, Texas, uh, and some uh, one with Joe Morfeld, who uh, Robert and Joe and Patrick from Zilker will be on a panel with me later on at this Brew Accelerator to talk about uh, IPA again for all the attendees here at the event. Um, appreciate you being a part of that and appreciate you all uh, uh, hosting our kickoff here for the Brewery Accelerator. Robert, if people want to learn more about Meanwhile, where can they find you all, both here in Austin at this beautiful, gigantic beer garden uh, and uh, also, you know, in any other place? Yep. Uh, best place to try our beer is right here at the tap room. Um, please come visit us. And then, uh, yeah, we have all of the, we have a Instagram that's fairly active and um, I'm sure some other social as well. <laughs> that's not my meanwhile, lane. Meanwhile, Brewing Company, yeah. go, go check it out on the, mm-hmm. on the socials. Anyway, great talking with you about brewing. Cheers. Thank you. This podcast has been brought to you by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine for those who love to make and drink great beer. To learn more or to subscribe, visit beerandbrewing.com or find us on social media at Craft Beer Brew. 